Uh, there is a huge literature concerning the relationship between economic coups and economic performance. Uh, if we study the literature in political science, economy, uh, development studies, and democratization studies, actually, uh, there is empirical literature, especially from uh, Middle East, Latin America, and various developing countries, that actually uh, poor economic performance uh, generally tends to trigger socioeconomic polarization, um, different problems in social fabric, and then triggers international pressures in developing country politics, and then trigger military coups. Uh, and especially, I think, the most important link in this context relates to the issue of political legitimacy, because in the case of most developing countries, the key uh, element that keeps the country together and that forms the bond between the rulers and the society is political legitimacy, uh, which is derived from development, uh, socioeconomic transformation and modernization. And if you have an economic crisis, for example, if you have recession, stagflation, or any kind of economic problem, usually uh, you tend to lose this kind of political legitimacy. You try to uh, establish it, most of the uh, political uh, establishments, political parties, try to strengthen political legitimacy. But if they have a legitimacy problem, due to economy, then it opens up a space for especially international pressures, uh, pressures by uh, major global powers, and then might lead to domestic manipulations or lead to uh, military intervention at the end. Uh, if you look at the relationship between economic coups uh, and economy in Turkey, uh, in over the course of Turkey's political history, actually, we see that there is a strong correlation between economic coups uh, and poor economic performance because, for example, if we study the 27th of May 1960 coup, prior to that coup, there was economic recession and there was a standby agreement with the IMF uh, signed in 1958. So the 1960 coup came uh, at the end of a process uh, characterized by economic crisis, social polarization, uh, tense, tense political competition between parties, and social crisis. And at the end, there was international pressure coming from the US government and international circles, and uh, there was a coup. The same pattern was repeated in 1980, 12th of September 1980 coup. Uh, we had economic problems at the end of 1970s, and there was social polarization, there was even terror and violence. And at the end, this social polarization and uh, the abyss in uh, politics uh, led to a military coup. So the Turkish example or the Turkish experience uh, with military coups actually shows us that there is a strong link between poor economic performance because poor economic performance tends to undermine uh, political legitimacy of selected political parties and leaders. So this kind of eroding legitimacy is sometimes used by domestic, uh, sometimes forces and international forces uh, that are trying to sometimes manipulate or intervene into the uh, regular flow of democratic politics to trigger a coup. And the coup comes at the end. This is like a vicious circle. So you have at the beginning economic recession or crisis followed by social polarization, uh, tense like enmity between different political parties, sometimes accompanied by security problems or terror, and at the end you have a military coup. So the Turkish kind of pattern is uh, pretty much, we could say, especially in 1960 and 1980, uh, we could also say that the 28th of February uh, process, which was a postmodern military coup, followed a pretty similar kind of a structure in which it followed the 1994 uh, economic crisis. So there was economic crisis, coalition governments, and then a kind of a postmodern coup in 1997, 1998. So we can say that this has been uh, the pattern in Turkey, but obviously the 15th of July coup was different, and we will uh, underline the difference in terms of its characteristics. The 15th of July coup is categorically different than the military coups before because the Turkish economy was performing very well before the coup. 
So there was no decline in uh, growth rates. There was no economic recession, stagflation, or any kind of problem because the economy was performing quite strongly before the coup. But the coup itself is different than most of the previous coups because it was, as we know, now know, it was uh, performed by the military officers that were affiliated by FETÖ terror organization and not by the chain of command of the Turkish armed forces. So it was like a narrow group uh, organized within the army. So uh, the coup itself was different in terms of organization and in terms of its link with the economy, it was also different because before the coup, there was no justification or uh, kind of economic reason to, to justify, no reason can justify a coup, but at least in terms of understanding the rationality of the coup, there was no rational kind of economic reason uh, to foresee a coup beforehand. And after that, especially after the uh, 15th of July coup attempt, Turkish economy recovered quite fast, uh, both the central bank and uh, the economic agencies responsible for macroeconomic policy, they responded quite fast, actually. And then there was expansionary fiscal and monetary policies, which increased Turkey's growth performance after the coup. So uh, the performance of uh, economic growth, uh, socioeconomic development was uh, quite positive, we could say, in the aftermath of the coup. But obviously, there was kind of a cost of all that expansionary policy to uh, to the public budget, which, which had to be normalized after a while. And now we are going through that, this normalization process. Well, if you look at the structural implications, we could say that Turkish economy recovered quite well. Uh, as I said, both the central bank, the treasury, and most of the uh, central economic agencies uh, prepared important responses to the coup attempt. Uh, and there was an innovative uh, measure under the rubric of the credit guarantee fund, which was uh, established after the coup to provide fresh financing for the uh, small and medium-sized enterprises. And it provided billions of dollars in terms of credit guarantees to the small and medium-sized enterprises to spur, spur economic growth across Anatolia. And it was very effective we could say that and, uh, in the economic kind of policymaking circles uh, in the developed and developing countries, this was seen as a very innovative tool of providing uh, fresh finance to the small and medium sized enterprises without losing fiscal stability and fiscal discipline. So uh, credit guarantee fund obviously continues its activities, uh, but over time, the size of the fund will get smaller. And then Turkish economy now obviously needs to normalize after the coup. And this expansionary policies, expansionary fiscal uh, and monetary policies could be uh, taken to normal levels. And you know, the, now the dis discussion especially centers around interest rates and the exchange rate. And uh, with the transition to the presidential system, obviously we had the 24th of June uh, presidential and general elections and Turkey is being going through uh, transformation in terms of the governance structure and the governance system. And I think with the transition to the presidential system, the performance of macroeconomic management, the efficiency uh, of the decision-making mechanism will improve and the remaining impacts of the 15th of July coup and the following process uh, will be uh, eliminated. And you know, after this uh, transition, I think uh, the, the system in which we're gonna have only three ministries governing macroeconomic policy and the new uh, councils and offices around the presidency will make economic policy making smoother and more effective as i say and turkey will move faster towards knowledge intensive and high value added economic structure